重宝していただいたということでございます。それでは早速あのお願いしたいと思います。Thank you very much, Hiroshi San. Good morning, everyone. So, what I would like to do is, I'm not here to sell you anything. I'm here to hopefully share with you a story about what we've done in BNY Mellon to use the ITCMF over the last few years. Please, have just to to give you a little bit of an, an understanding of the purpose of this discussion here today.、Um, one thing I would definitely ask that you do is please raise your hand,、uh, ask questions as we go. I'm going to be covering a lot of different material. And it's a much more useful discussion if you ask me questions, tell me what you're interested in, tell me what challenges you're experiencing. I'll do my best to share with you things that we have learned as an organization、uh, and would like to, I'm here to help you, to help you understand the purpose of the framework, the value of the framework, and、uh, some of the challenges that we've experienced in adopting this framework to drive improvement of our technology management. So, As we have summarized here, the purpose of why we adopted the IT Capability Maturity Framework was that we want to make sure that we're doing our best throughout our organization to create great outcomes for our customers.、Okay? And we want to make sure that we're able to perform well in a changing environment. The world is changing. Um, and as you've already heard this morning, we have many issues with regulation,、uh, with innovation, with、uh, digital, with big data, with so many different things. So, how do we invest in our own organization, in our own ability to manage, to be more successful? So, we've applied a number of techniques to assess our capabilities, to manage them, and to improve them. And we've used the ITCMF、uh, as part of that、uh, improvement journey. And we've learned a few things about running assessments, about driving improvement,、um, and really about also one of the topics we feel is very important is managing the services that we provide as an organization and integrating different capabilities to help those services be successful. So I hope to finish with some recommendations for you, things for you to consider.、Um, each of you will have different things that you'll take away. That will be relevant to you and your role in your organization.、Um, so, I do hope that this is helpful. And as I said, please do、uh, ask questions as we go.、Um, I thank you also for our interpreters for interpreting this session. This is my first time having a live interpreted session.、Uh, I think it's fantastic. They're doing such a great job. So, thank you. So, I want to start with a, a quote.、Uh, and in fact, I don't think we saw it, but Haru. As shown here. This is a new book recently published by the Innovation Value Institute, the ITCMF Body of Knowledge Guide.、Um, much of the material that's contained in this book has been available to、uh, companies like BNY Mellon and other member companies for a number of years.、Uh, but the, the research team at IVI spent a, a significant amount of time condensing down the, the large body of knowledge into a usable reference book. That, that is here.、Um, and we're very proud to have been asked to provide a foreword to the book. So, our CIO, Suresh Kumar, put this,、uh, this is a piece of the foreword that's in the book.、Um, and I wanted to share that with you because I think it shares some of the important elements of why we find the ITCMF to be a valuable、uh, framework. So, firstly, That this is an organizational priority. Creating excellence in our capabilities is very important to us at BNY Mellon.、Um, we have made, made sure that we assign and hold accountable senior people in our organization to be accountable for the management and improvement of our organizational capabilities.、Um, we do use a variety of management approaches. It's not just about the ITCMF. But the ITCMF does enable us to holistically to have a, a, a complete picture. Of aligning those aspects that relate to managing technology.、Okay? Now, we've been running with our improvement program for around three, just a little over three years, and we have seen objective benefits from this program.、Okay? We've, we've been able to focus on key areas of managing our IT function. We've been able to decrease cost, millions of dollars of cost taken out of our IT environment. We've been able to focus on improving the satisfaction. Of our business and end users with our technology solutions, because that's an important thing for us. 
Um, uh, some other things I could mention, we've been able to improve the ways that we manage the many vendors that we have relationships with. Uh, we've been able to manage the ways that we uh, motivate and empower our workforce through people asset management practices, as an example. Um, there are many, many capabilities, as you'll see and, and have seen in the ITCMF, that relate to a lot of different domains, and we've been able to invest in many of them with good success. But it hasn't been easy, and I'll, I'll share with you some of those challenges. Okay. So just a little bit, oh, I shouldn't do that, okay. <laughs> a little bit about BNY Mellon, I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview. I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about the IT capability maturity framework. I think Haru-san did a fantastic job of getting through it very quickly. Um, I may take slightly longer, I might illustrate a couple of points, but uh, the material is available for your review so you can see the names of the capabilities and understand some of the structure. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the, the value um, of, of assessments and what we've done in that space. I'll talk a bit about our own improvement structure and the lessons that we've learned. Um, I'll talk a little about the relationship between managing services and managing capabilities, and then again, hopefully leave you with some recommendations and some thoughts to consider. So BNY Mellon itself uh, is a large investments-centric company. We're a financial services industry company that really supports a significant amount uh, of many of the financial services organizations globally. Uh, as you can see by some of the numbers, some of the things that we do um, are you know, really a full financial life cycle, the full investment life cycle of service is what BNY, BNY Mellon supports. So we help clients uh, create assets, trade assets, hold and manage assets, and, and we service and distribute those assets um, for our client companies. Now to do that, we have a significant technology organization which supports that diverse array of business processes and business products. And as you can see by some of the numbers we have here, uh, they're not small numbers. You know, uh, $1.6 trillion worth of assets under management, $28 trillion worth of assets under custody and or administration. Um, and I think on a subsequent slide you'll see the volume of uh, assets even that we uh, transact with on a daily basis is, is very significant. So it's a lot of business. Uh, it's very important business. Uh, we're considered by United States regulators to be what's called a global systemically important financial institution. Now what that means for us is that we have increased regulatory oversight, but it's an indicator of the importance of BNY Mellon as an institution within the global financial markets. So we take our work very seriously uh, in terms of the function of technology and the value of technology to our business and to our clients. As you can see here, we do have a global footprint. We operate in 35 countries, over 100 different markets. Um, and some very important things for us is our ability within our organization to work collaboratively with one another, to understand the expertise and the best practice throughout the organization to learn from one another to improve ourselves. That's been very important. Um, it also helps us to deliver those solutions to clients in their local markets through people who are in those markets as well as through this collaborative network of tens of thousands of employees that we have within the organization. As you can see here for Asia Pacific, uh, we have over 12,000 people here in the region. Um, operating in 12 different countries with offices, as you can see here on the map, in a number of different sites. So it's important to us to be global, to have a global perspective, but also to have a, an ability to act locally, to implement solutions locally that are sensible and relevant to the local market and to our local staff. Now I'll share with you a couple of the challenges that we've seen as a result of operating a financial services company in the digital age. So some of the challenges that we see for our clients are the sense of complexity in the global markets, the sense of complexity and difficulty to make decisions uh, around investment choices for different asset classes in different regions. Um, as uh, Sachin said, you know, regulation and compliance is such a pressing issue. It's such an important issue. Um, I'm not sure if I would agree with him that it's the most important issue. I think it's a fairly significant uh, what the word uh, maybe um, 
perhaps a constraint or a requirement to meet regulation, it's, it's critically important. Um, one thing I always like to talk about is the value that we're creating, though, as an organization. Um, our clients perhaps are not necessarily coming to us because we're great at, at being regulatory compliant. They're looking for us to provide solutions to them, and I think that's one of the most important things. But there's no doubt that regulatory changes are challenging. Uh, they're experienced by us. They're experienced by our clients. And we are able to help our clients with those regulatory requirements. So that's a, a service that we can provide. Uh, again, here, things like the climbing costs of both technology and regulation, and how does an organization manage those costs. And finally, uh, as, as many organizations have faced uh, years of growth, acquisitions, changes in technology, the end result is a complicated mess in some cases of technology that's difficult, fragmented, costly to integrate, costly to streamline. So how does uh, an organization face that challenge? So some of the things that we do to help them with that is, again, as a service provider, our company, we can provide services that help clients offload some of those challenges so that we can take care of them instead of those clients having to invest in their own tools and technology and practices and their own uh, people to handle certain regulatory changes or handle the complexity of technology or those kinds of things. BNY Mellon is able to offer that service. Um, we're able to, because we have relationships with a large number of organizations globally, we have a lot of data at our disposal. And that data is very useful for business insights, um, even for technology management. So we are a fairly data-centric organization in terms of using measurement and metrics and data and information to understand the environment and to even provide insights both for ourselves and for our clients so they can have a better understanding of opportunities, threats, um, and ways that we can leverage information that, that's available to us. Certainly risk management is critical. Um, one of the new capabilities in the ITCMF, the data protection capability, is certainly a, an, increasing, an increasingly important domain. Um, and we take risk management very seriously uh, as an organization. Uh, BNY Mellon has traditionally been considered, I think, one of the safest, if not the safest bank in the United States um, by external um, organizations who assess the safety of different financial institutions. Um, it's, it's, I think, really one of the hallmarks of BNY Mellon is to be a very secure, safe place. And uh, in times of trouble, we tend to see a significant amount of investments flowing into BNY Mellon for security. Uh, and of course, here, as I mentioned, evidence-based analytics, both within our technology organization, but also with and for our clients. So that hopefully provides you with a little bit of a backdrop of some of the things that we do organizationally. And I hope it also helps you to understand the seriousness of our technology function and that we see a great need to continue investing in becoming better at what we do in many different ways. So the rest of this discussion will be, how have we gone about doing that? So this slide here, unfortunately, there's a lot of detail on it. It's not easy for you to read, but you'll be able to perhaps look at it uh, on your printouts. I use this slide really just to share a few key points. One of them is that there is no one solution for us, right? There's no one thing. We're not only doing, say, service management or only doing capability management or only trying to be strategic or only trying to drive innovation or only investing in our people or only trying to maintain a stable environment. We're doing all of these things. So one of the challenges is to integrate all of those different ways to manage and improve our technology. And, and again, not just the technology, not just the systems, but the ability of our teams to be successful, uh, for our processes to be streamlined and effective and interrelated with one another, for our st strategy to be clear, um, and for us to be able to execute on that strategy. Those are the kinds of things that we do. And we do them uh, ideally, holistically, and in concert. But it's not easy, and we're certainly far from perfect at that. So you can see that our ability to meet clients' needs and anticipate our clients' needs is supported by a wide array of both management techniques and uh, other frameworks and other techniques. And the ITCMF is one of the tools that we use. So as I, you know, Haru, as I said, already did a good job of introducing the ITCMF. Um, so this, th these slides here are sort of a variant on what he shared with you. But I'll just call a couple of points to you 
as you may see uh, over here, some of the value uh, of the IT capability maturity framework is one of the very important things to be understanding is in one way it's able to help a CIO evaluate and understand their organization better. Um, we've seen that for ourselves, for instance, being able to understand how mature or effective are we for these different capabilities, both for our different business units and for our different geographies even. So we can see that variability and having a better understanding enables us to be more effective at driving improvement. Okay? It also enables us to do comparisons to other organizations who've used these assessments and now we have an industry benchmark. So we can understand where does BNY Mellon sit or what level are we at, both uh, at, a, at a complete level, you know, across the whole framework, as well as for each of the capabilities, and how does that compare to other organizations? So we can see where do we have relative weaknesses or strengths compared to others, and therefore make decisions uh, in relationship to that. And then another uh, aspect that's very useful to a CIO or a technology leadership team is that the ITCMF really does provide a number of different ways to define an improvement path for the organization, whether that's for the organization overall or for a single unit within the organization, even a single team or a single function, such as, say, project management or risk management or some aspect of reducing cost. Um, so that ability for us to take those improvement step suggestions from the ITCMF and, and apply them within our own context is very useful. The other, um, this slide, it's a bit of a, a, I would say, perhaps a challenging slide to interpret initially. It, you know, it sort of, it looks as if ITCMF is this wonderful thing in the upper right of the slide. Um, this is actually a slide we inherited from uh, the Innovation Value Institute, from IBI. But I like it if you look at what the axes are saying, okay? So don't, please don't take this as the ITCMF is this wonderful thing out there by itself. What this slide is showing us is really two main things. One of them is it has a significant breadth of coverage. Many different capabilities are found within the ITCMF. So that's this horizontal dimension. Whereas many other models and frameworks are very focused on a particular need. And they're very good at that. So we find that to be very useful. The other uh, vertical axis is the relevance of a framework or a model to, a, to each level of practitioner or level of um, role within the organization, where there's relatively less support for senior management structure and decision making in many frameworks. Now things like the balanced scorecard is very relevant to the executive leadership of an organization. Um, but things like, say, the project management body of knowledge from PMI, which I'm very familiar with, are primarily directed at project management practitioners, at those individual professionals who manage projects. So again, the benefit of the ITCMF is this ability to connect across a variety of capabilities and to be more relevant to senior managers, but it's also quite relevant to practitioners. So I would almost sort of draw that ITCMF context vertically in that it can be applied by people in different levels of the organization for their needs, and that's useful. And then the final thing I would say about this is that it's not... Um, hey, all you need is the ITCMF and it'll meet all of your challenges. That is not true. What's more true is that you can use, and we have used the ITCMF as a reference structure within which we can apply good practices from these other models and frameworks. You know, how can we apply good tools and techniques from Six Sigma, from Lean, from project management, from uh, TOGAF and architecture management, and so on and so on, all of these have their place, they all have their context, and we find most of this to be useful and relevant to us. We find the ITCMF to be helpful to integrate those different domains. So we already saw here uh, from Haru-san uh, what we call the, uh, the taxonomy or the, the, uh, the, ta the, the periodic table of elements, if you will, of the capabilities. The important thing about this is this is one of the ways that we can, we don't tend to talk about this topic, this slide, this picture with our senior management very much. However, uh, as Haru showed us, there are ways that you can understand the different characteristics of maturity, either for an individual critical capability or for one of those macro capabilities, 
and have that dialogue with business leaders and technology leaders and say, for instance, one of the things that we are working on is moving from being seen as a cost center to be, you know, to decrease cost, to be seen and act as a value center within the organization that is driving appreciation uh, from our clients and even driving revenue for the organization because of the quality and value of our technology solutions in total. Now, there's some useful information in here that's good to understand. Uh, this is a picture of some basic characteristics of the maturity levels within the ITCMF. Now, as you can see here on the right-hand side, the general purpose of the maturity levels is to indicate that a more mature capability will be delivering more value for the organization and more value for clients. But the trick is, how do we do that? Or what does that look like? How do we understand where we are and how do we then go from where we are today and improve that capability to greater levels of maturity over time? So the helpful thing about this picture is that you can see if, if you say down here at level one, if much of what we do, I mean, let's, and we'll make an example, okay, let's pick one capability such as project management, okay? If our project management practices within our organization are ad hoc, or in other words, if each individual project manager is having to come up with their own way to manage projects, they may be able to manage those projects, but some of them are gonna be good and some of them are gonna be terrible. Okay, so the sense of being ad hoc or unmanaged is a, a, a characteristic of low maturity. Okay, as you move up, say, towards level three, you start seeing consistency, consistent application of practice across the enterprise for, for whichever domain you're talking about. Okay, there's an increased focus on value creation. Okay, so starting to go away from individual tools and techniques, like again, if you looked at a sort of less mature project management, the individual project manager may be very focused on specific things like I'm going to manage scope and I'm going to manage my team and I'm going to manage you know, certain other attributes of the project, but they're not thinking about the end result, the outcome of the project within the context of their business. Whereas in a more mature environment, that same project manager will be very much focusing their team and having interactions with senior leaders and sponsors and customers to make sure that the result of the project is truly a valuable result and that that result is actually realized. So that's a characteristic that you start seeing at level three. And of course at level five, to sort of jump up to level five, that there's really complete alignment in the organization where technology, business, operations, and other support functions are integrated. They're very strategic, they're very focused, and really even um, applying world-class practice beyond the enterprise. So engaging with partners, with suppliers, uh, with even with clients to make sure that the end-to-end -end creation of value in the business ecosystem is happening effectively. All right. Does anyone have any questions on any of this at this point? You should pause for questions periodically. Haru-san, or are you just jumping up? <laughs> All right, I'll keep going. Oh, sorry, we have a question. Wonderful. Tomita-san. Do you think uh, page 14? Page 14? Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, this one? Oh, no, or hold on, 14. Yes, IGCMF defined uh, 35 or 36 uh, this guy. critical uh, capabilities. And uh, what kind of philosophy behind to select the plus 34 macro capabilities and then uh, 35 uh, critical uh, capabilities? How actually? Those uh, CC find out uh, who actually defined as important. Yes, yes, okay. So I take your question, uh, Tamita san, to be related to the structure, the macro structure of the framework. So we have four critical, four macro capabilities across the top managing IT like a business, managing the IT budget, 
managing the IT capability and managing IT for business value. Um, my answer to that is that that in the development of the framework, you know, coming out of Intel and other uh, partners, you know, building the early versions of the framework, there were really two clear needs. One of them was that technology organizations traditionally were reasonably good at the types of capabilities you see within managing the IT capability. Somewhat more of an internal management focus, an internal functional focus within technology management. So that's a, a summary of the groupings of the capabilities within that space. Now those are important capabilities, I mean each of these are important capabilities, but what was seen was a need for technology leadership to be more business-like in their thinking. So a lot of the capabilities that are in the managing IT like a business macro are things like strategic planning and business planning, uh, sustainability, you know, uh, doing effective sourcing decisions. So the types of capabilities that are found across on the managing IT like a business ca uh, macro capability are more helpful to bring a more business-like approach to the overall management of IT. Now, managing the IT budget would again be something I would say is a fairly standard traditional function. Most IT organizations are, have competence at managing their budgets to a certain extent. Um, they may struggle with cost transparency for their business, but managing their budget is, is again a fairly um, historically normal domain. Um, but the other one that's perhaps a little bit more of a differentiator in the IT CMF is this fourth macro capability of managing IT for business value. And I think this is one of the hallmarks of the framework. The sense of what is truly valuable to our business, and what is truly valuable to our clients, to our market. Um, the, the three critical capabilities that are found within managing IT for business value include, firstly, benefits assessment and realization. Now that capability relates very much to how do you define and measure the benefits that you intend to create and are you actually measuring the realization of those benefits within your environment, right? Portfolio management is all about are you managing your total portfolio of investment, including your projects and services and technology, are you managing that portfolio with an eye towards the creation of value for your business? Are those decisions being made in a value-centric way? And then, of course, total cost of ownership, because value is basically benefits created minus costs, one of the, there's, there's two, e, the, you know, and actually also accounting for risk is sort of the third aspect of value creation. So you've got to manage risk, you've got to manage cost, and maximize, ideally, benefits created. Those three things come together, and that's what we see here. So, Tamita San, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. I will also say, and you'll see this uh, in a little bit, is we uh, found that we wanted to have a slightly different uh, collection of those capabilities for our own needs at BNY Mellon. And that's another benefit of the framework. We've seen that it's a flexible framework that you can manage, you can, you can tailor to your own needs. You can take a lot of the content, and it's very useful, good content, but you can rework it to a certain amount uh, to, to be more relevant. And that's what we've done. And I'll show you that in a little bit. So this picture here, I'll just talk about this briefly. This relates to one of the challenges that we have seen with uh, some other models and frameworks is the sense of context. I mentioned that earlier, that in some cases, senior leaders need to have a certain level of understanding to make a decision on a topic, right? Maybe to invest in a new technology, maybe to invest in a particular management practice, maybe to make some other strategic decision. So the ITCMF can help with that in terms of having a high level of structure, the macro capability structure, if you will, to help guide senior decision making. Conversely, at the other end of the spectrum within an organization, you may have individual practitioners who simply say, you know what, all I really want to do is, as a project manager, for instance, I want to have better project management tools and techniques that I can use, okay? And what this shows us is that the ITCMF uh, very effectively decomposes, it is structured in a, in a hierarchical fashion so that you can have an understanding of these topics at different levels of detail. Um, at the lowest level here, we talk about individual practices, the outcomes that you would expect to experience if you performed those practices on a consistent basis within your organization, and how might you measure 
those outcomes or how might you measure whether those practices are being effective. And that's at the individual practitioner level that we see here. Um, these practices and outcomes and metrics are a construct. There are thousands of them. I think it's actually over 3,000 now within the ITCMF. Uh, I've, I've seen that put people off. It's like, well, 3,000 different things. I can't handle 3,000 different things. You know, you know, please go give that to someone else to, to handle. That's not how it works. Okay? For each of you as individuals, you will have your own domain of specialization, your own expertise, right? your own role. And within that context, for you as an individual, you may find perhaps a few dozen practices that may be very relevant to you individually. So the nice thing is you can take this material from the framework. You can look at those perhaps few dozen practices for yourself, whether you're a leader, whether you're an architect, uh, a manager of people, a, a project manager, a risk manager, a finance manager, so many other different roles, you can find material that's relevant to you as an individual practitioner. So that's helpful. But the other thing it, it helps us to do is to connect those practices across domains. So the relationships between project managers, uh, finance people, resource managers, uh, infrastructure managers, and so on, you can start to see and understand those connections of function within IT. And you can start to see where are we less mature, where are we weaker, relatively speaking. And within this construct, you can then make some decisions where, again, at, this, at each level, the practices level, the building block level, the categories, the capability level, each of these levels have descriptions of maturity, those different five levels of maturity. And you can make de decisions to say, if I'm at a two, roughly a level two maturity, for a particular practice or a particular building block, I can see, it's illustrated, how do I get to level three? Or what are the characteristics of level three? And I can then work with my team to invest in implementing that level of practice and to become more effective. So, any questions about, sorry, I'll jump back there again. There's sort of, there's a lot of potential context in this slide. Hopefully it's a simple story. Any other, any other thoughts or questions about that topic there? Actually, uh, could you help us how actually the uh, Bank of New York Mellon does the assessment? Yes. And how much actually IBI helps to, for example, to use the, uh, the achievability data uh, that is the tones? Yes. So how, how actually... Uh, start the, uh, the people would like to probably start uh, this capability assessment. So yes. could you hear about uh, the experience? Sure, sure. Thank you for the question. So the question is, how did we at BNY Mellon start doing assessments? How do we conduct them? And then how do we convert an assessment into a improvement activity? Now, I don't have, I don't think I have any direct slides on the assessment process, um, but there's a few elements that are worth sharing with you briefly. One of them is that we decided to invest very early on in terms of using the ITCMF, we decided to invest in creating skilled individuals within our company who can both understand the framework and a, a subset of people who can actually run assessments. I'm one of those people, I'm able to run assessments. I actually run our executive assessment each year. We just completed our fourth executive assessment um, a few weeks ago. So the assessment process is relatively straightforward. It is a comp it's a combination of an online survey tool, which we distribute and we invite uh, contributors from both IT, all of our different parts of IT, as well as business contributors, because we like to see both perspectives. Right? So they complete a series of questions that relate to these different capabilities. The questions give, give us an understanding of the relative maturity of practice for each of these capabilities. There's three main variables in an assessment. What is our maturity like today? as an organization for each of the capabilities. Uh, and again, if you were taking an assessment, the question would also be, in your opinion, where do you think we should aspire to be in, say, two years' time? So if you think we're at level two, and you think it's worth investing effort and time to become, say, level three or level four, then you provide that input. And the other thing that is very important is a rating of the importance of those different topics. Because it's not possible, we've not found it possible, to significantly improve everything at one time. So we ask people to think about where do you think is the most important areas to drive improvement, attention, and focus. 
Right? So those are the three things, current maturity, future desired maturity, and relative importance of improvement. And each of you would probably, if you started taking this, you'd have thinking about your own organization, and you'd see those topics, and you would be able to provide your thoughts. And that's one of the things we find very valuable about the assessment. It's not other people telling us what to do. It's our own people providing their skill and their expertise with what do you think we should do. Now, I said uh, the assessment is multi-part. The survey is one component. The survey uh, also gathers commentary from the people who are taking it. So that's really important because we read a lot of that commentary and people are suggesting what should we specifically do or what are the specific challenges that they're seeing that need to be addressed. So either both illustrating the problems as well as illustrating what are some suggestions for improvement. So that commentary comes through from the survey. The other thing though that we do is we reach out both to senior business managers and technology leaders and other professionals to conduct a series of interviews. Those interviews provide a lot of context for our organization, a lot of uh, rich information about what's really going on and where should we truly focus. And we then, as a team, bring uh, all of this material together as a series of findings and recommendations for our senior leadership team. And that senior leadership team subsequently makes decisions as to who's going to be responsible for, being, uh, for owning a particular domain of practice, a particular capability, and making sure, and you'll see this on a subsequent slide, how do we provide the right investment of resources and focus and goals and measurement and other elements to create that improvement. So we take the assessments and convert that into what I would say are, you could say either strategic plans or business plans for the coming one to two years as to where do we want to improve and what's our expectation for improvement. Uh, I'm not sure that fully answers your question, Tamita, because there's a, there's a lot of detail on that topic about the response, and I'm going to share some of that with you here shortly. So I, um, I used this slide. Who here, just to give me a sense, is familiar with and or practices service management, like, if you will, ITIL, or services as means to create value within the organization? Who is a service management aware individual here in the room? No one? Martin, thank you. Martin, Tamita, okay. So services are another, if you will, another way of looking at managing the organization. So I'm going to share with you just a simple picture of what that means to us. We actually um, inherited this from, um, from Intel, from Jim Keneally, who's another member of a very significant contributor to IVI, a senior researcher and, in fact, I think the head of research at the moment in IVI. And this picture here, I've always found this to be a very valuable illustration of the relationships. Okay, so at the top, we have this sense of any business is in the business of creating value for customers, right? That's what business is all about. Business is all about how can we serve our customers to create valuable outcomes for them or with them. And the way that that happens is through the capabilities of the business. The, the products and services that the business offers, the, capability, the internal capabilities of the business provide those products and services, and those products and services are then realized as valuable outcomes for customers. So, if that's what's happening at a very big, big picture level for a business, how does that relate to IT? Well, the need for the, for the, for the business itself to function effectively, for its capabilities to function, these days, almost always means that there's a requirement for technology in some way, usually in many, many ways, right? And that's expressed as the services that IT delivers to the business or within the business. So in that form of IT services are expressed and deliver value to the, to the capabilities of the business, which are rolled in to the products and services of that business to create positive outcomes for customers. So services are you know, packages of technology outcomes. They can include, of course, hardware, software, people, teams, processes, many different things all come together to create that service. So therefore we say, okay, so if services are sort of a big picture look at the ability for IT to create value within the business, then what sits underneath and supports all of those services are the capabilities, the capabilities of the technology organization itself. Things like process management, is integral to what we do. Managing our people, you know, making sure they're skillful, 
making sure they're motivated and empowered, that they have the right tools and techniques, um, using effective knowledge assets throughout the organization, having good technology, um, managing risk, and, and many other capabilities. So we see the relationship between capabilities, supporting services, services supporting business capabilities, helping to create valuable outcomes for customers. Now, the last piece of this puzzle is, well, okay, if we're not happy with where we are today, if we think that we need to improve, what do we do? Typically, the way we do that is to invest in improving an aspect of a capability. Usually, that's how it works. We may be investing in technology. We may be investing in training people or improving a process or some other as aspect. But usually, it's a capability-centric improvement. Now, it may be many things. It may be a program of improvement that maybe rolls up to a complete service or a complete business function. But usually, your operational impact is at the capability level. And so we sort of see this here, that, that either you're putting in place major projects or programs to implement change, and or you're running more continual improvement types of activities and events. OK? And that's how we, that's how we operate uh, within our own IT environment, that we manage our overall organization by the services we provide, and we also improve capabilities across the organization to support many of those services. So, this next slide, and I, it's gonna, I'm going to build it for you again, is things that we have found to be useful and valuable in terms of driving organizational change. Um, we've seen that it's not easy to create change in an organization. Change is not natural. It's, it's difficult. Um, uh, there's, a lot, uh, there's a lot of uh, headwind to overcome trying to change the behaviors of the people in the organization. So we put this what works list, we call it what works list, we don't have a better name for it. Uh, we put this together, it's actually a composite of guidance from a number of different other models and frameworks, including the ITCMF, including CMMI, uh, and, and other frameworks. Now I'll just do this very briefly because I'm keeping an eye on the time as well. But the key elements of this that are important are that we have a commitment to improvement, a commitment at the senior leadership level to improve. Um, that commitment is expressed both as individual goals at the level of senior leaders. We actually have performance-based goals for senior leaders to make sure that they're directly accountable for different capabilities and that they're accountable for those improvements. Okay? And that they're responsible for providing resources to drive improvement and drive change. Okay? We also see as necessary, and we've certainly seen when this does work and when this doesn't work, the need to invest in what we're calling building a world-class capability. And there are two main attributes to that, as you can see here. It's both creating and providing assets for use, such as guidance, tools and techniques, knowledge assets, a community of practice, and also seeing evidence of adoption. Now, there's no good if we're coming up with new ways, for instance, to manage projects, if no one's using those new ways. Right? So seeing adoption occurring is important. And doing that through a community of practice is also very important. Because what we've seen very much fail is if one group of people tries to build something, some set of practices, and gives that to another set of people and says, we know what's best, you do this. That typically doesn't work very well. Right? So we are very inclusive in the work that we do for improving capabilities. And we say, you tell us what are your challenges. You tell us what's working well for you. And we're going to share with you some things that we've seen that look to be helpful. And let's work together to try and drive improvement. So the community of practice is critical. The final thing, the final sort of, of the three main things that we consider very important are that we're seeing practices in use and we're seeing feedback and measurement of outcomes to, to see that it's actually being successful. Now, I have a whole lot of detail, but I'm not going to go into the detail here. You can see this. You have this on your printout. Um, but these things together, if you have them, you're in good shape. But it's not easy to make sure these things are actually in place. These are challenging domains to implement, but they're worth it. OK, so I'm going to really quickly skim through this. This is our alternate version of the macro capability picture. Uh, and I'll show you this for a reason. Um, one of the things is that we have on our investor site for BNY Mellon this striving to be the provider of choice with a number of characteristics, particularly around our recognition of our capabilities and our client service-centric culture. Right? So how do we reframe that for technology? 
So the first thing we do is we say, right, the number one thing we have to do is deliver excellent service. And when we think about that topic of delivering excellent service, we subsequently identified a range of capabilities within the ITCMF that to us most strongly relate to delivering excellent service. We then say, we need to enable that service, we need to enable that function through a number of other capabilities, such as people and knowledge and uh, uh, information management and risk management and so on. And we then also see the need, of course, to manage our finances. So there's another host of capabilities there. The other piece is that we're never content to be static. We need to drive change. We need to execute on strategic objectives. So there's a whole host of capabilities that relate to the um, generation, the delivery of outcomes that are strategic. And there's nine different capabilities that we identified there. We also see a need for, the, for, many, for, for all parts of the organization to continually be seeking ways to improve. So again, we identified a set of capabilities that related to us to continual improvement practices. And then finally, as I said at the very beginning, with that macro capability of managing IT for business value, this need to have value leadership in place that surrounds all of these other practices and focuses on the relationship with our business peers and, 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 and clients, um, our ability to create effective strategy, our ability to actually act in effective leadership ways, and our ability to define and manage value realization. So with that, um, I think I will wrap it up. Um, this has been uh, you know, mostly an overview of some of the structural things that we've done. I have dozens of stories of the achievements that we've had within our teams, but these are the elements that we've found to support those teams to be successful. So thank you very much for your time. Um, really pleasure to be here, to come and visit you here in Tokyo. It's been a lovely first visit for me to Tokyo. So thank you very much.